Good evening, everyone. My name is Paul Young. I'm, I'm doing a series of videos to walk you through different government policies and statement. Part of the reason why I'm doing it is I'm trying to give you a picture that, for whatever reason, either the media is not asking these questions, and I, that means the media like Global TV, CBC, CTV, Global Mail, Toronto Star, etc., are not asking specific questions on policy. They're basically giving scripted questions and not really holding people like Mulcair or Justin Trudeau to task on statements in terms of getting clarification. So since the media won't actually allow for freedom of speech in terms of the actual facts being portrayed or drilling people like Mulcair to get get him to commit on his statements and expand on it, I have taken the liberty over the last month and a half to prepare some videos. This particular video I'm going to go walk you through is on the military spending in Canada. Now I'm coming from it from a perspective where I'm a finance person that's very interested in government policies and its impact. Now I won't go into the specifics of any particular operations or the fundamental issues with equipment or anything else related to that would require more of a military background and tactics or just understanding the operational size of medical, military and global warfare. What I will come at is the role of the Canadian military since Stephen Harper has taken office which was in 2006 and that's what I really am going to expand but I'm going to set up some pretenses to that. So let's talk about the Canadian military role. If we go back and I'm only going to go back to the 70s and on, the world's a different place from where we were in the 1970s to where we are now in 2000. The biggest threat now that to world peace is a multitude of issues. We've got issues like North Korea that basically is one of the last few communist regimes out there that basically is a threat, um, especially in Asia. We've got uh, terrorist groups, whether that's the Boko Haram in Nigeria or ISIS or other groups out there that basically are bent on either creating their own Sharia law or other aspects of human rights violation. Now, part of Canadian military role is pre-established by three ways. One is role existing in Canada, and that's basically governed by disasters or other things to support both border security as well as the Canadian Coast Guard and things from drugs drugs to uh, overfishing so they support those initiatives right that is part of the things with inmate in Canada solution the other role that they get involved with is UN mandated they may be sent on humanitarian efforts um, issues in flood areas or earthquakes many many years ago we sent our um, medical uh, dart team to Haiti to basically support earthquake relief processes we sent them also into uh, in Indonesia and other countries when they were, were impacted by tsunamis. So one of the things you do not hear um, Mulcair or Justin Trudeau talk about is that that role where we've gone into humanitarian aid or done some peacekeeping role. We've actually sent in military police officers to train in areas like uh, the Iraqi police force or Haiti, right? Along with the RCMP to train, but you don't hear that. So I wanted to kind of set the pretenses because Thomas Mulcair's view of the military is we should be peacekeeping. Well, peacekeeping works when you're in an area where you've got two sides that have agreed to peace terms. What you have in the Middle East is despite what Mulcair and his pandering likes to do, we have serious human rights issues there. Did we accomplish the right goals when we did things with Iraq? No, we didn't. But it doesn't change the fact that people there require support. Canada's there maybe not necessarily because NATO's asking them to be there, but the Iraqi government's asked and the world's pleaded for their help. Now remember, Canada's based in Turkey. Turkey's a NATO country. One of the things you'll never hear from either Thomas Mulcair or Justin Trudeau is that Canada's role is within NATO in the UN, more so NATO. If you attack a country in NATO, and that's Turkey, then it's an attack on NATO. You'll never hear basically Justin Trudeau say that or basically Mulcair say that. Why? Because they're pandering from emotions. They're not pandering on Canada's co commitment. And the other thing you will not hear is Canada helps out in the Middle East in different aspects too. We were helping fight piracy there off Somalia where they were hijacking ships. We've also had them involved with the drug smuggling 
Uh, they get involved with the fishery support. But you're never going to hear that from them. And you're never going to hear the commitment that Harper has done with the military. So basically, I just wanted to put this through. Just because this is a recent article. This highlights that basically NATO, NATO is working with Turkey. Um, just to give you some history, those of you are not familiar, Turkey's made up of a couple of distinct cultures. It's got its Turkish people, its deep roots of the Turks, and it's got the Kurds. The eastern part of Turkey is predominantly dominated by the Kurds, and those Kurds go into northern Syria and uh, northern uh, Iraq. And actually in Iraq, you can almost split Iraq into three areas, the Shiites, the Sunnis, and the Kurds. You don't hear much about the Kurds in northern Iraq because they've actually become pretty good in terms of modernization and moving things forward. Where you've got a lot of fractions in Iraq, it's between the Sunnis and the Shiites, which is central Iraq down to the southern part of Iraq, right? And this is critical to understand that because ISIS is playing into the central and southern part of Iraq and the north, central and southern part of uh, Syria as well in terms of their caliphate area where they want to kind of take that over right now part of that thing you need to bear in mind there is yes the way Canada's role is there we're there to provide basically support training to the uh, Iraqi Kurdish forces um, that's why we sent our JTF force in there we've also provided um, coverage in terms of the CF-18s have gone there to provide bombing support along with other countries as part of the European uh, project and operations that's going on in there but you won't hear about that talk about why because anytime you get into military action the NDP never supports it they don't support anything because you remember their roots go back to basically peace loving people think everybody's a nice person well unfortunately in this world we don't really have nice people we've seen this when we saw stuff happen in the 80s with the Serbia and Montenegro stuff in U Yugoslavia we've got dictators We've seen that over the history of that. So do you turn a blind eye to human rights issues, which seems to be the case with the NDP and the, the Liberals, or do you actually have a, a Prime Minister that actually supports human rights and will not tolerate violations? The second point I want to make is the other parties talk about humanitarian aid. You can't get humanitarian aid to people if you haven't secured that area. So what are you going to do, give food to them? All you're doing is feeding those people of the ISIS or the terrorist groups and the food's never getting to the people. So let's talk about peacekeeping. Now, bulk of Canada's peacekeeping happened in a lot of areas that you've heard about in the past with Yugoslavia. We've gone into areas like Cyprus and stuff like that where we helped basically keep the peace between different fractions. However, in certain areas, there's no peace to be kept. You can't send peacekeepers in an area where there's no peace or no treaties being honored. And that's one of the things that Thomas Mulcair doesn't get. Until you have established peace, you have no peacekeepers. And this kind of gives you the idea is Canada had, was a huge peacekeeping country. We've had that role since the Second World War. You, and it hasn't changed. We still get involved whenever UN or NATO or other countries require our effort in there to kind of help support things. That hasn't changed. It hasn't changed when it was John Kretschmann in power. It hasn't changed with basically Trudeau. We do. We've done peacekeeping. All Harper's done is fall in suit to basically highlight the need to basically have a better, bigger role in the grander picture of NATO and other involvements with help supporting countries. That's what really Har Harper's focus has been. Let's look at military spending. Now, bulk of these countries, when you look at the U.S., China, and Russia, have always put big money into the military. China's actually got the world's largest military, and they've kind of built up from their aircrafts to battleships to tanks and all that. And a few weeks ago, they actually just did their uh, annual show of force where they show all their military capabilities. Russia goes back to the Cold War. They're still pretty solid, and along with the U.S., puts a lot of money into it. Canada's fall, fall out, but they still spend a good... Um, Maybe at one in point, uh, maybe one in point two percent of GDP on military. So let's look at military spending. It makes sense that during the 50s that we peaked in terms of our GDP to spending on military. But if you look at during periods of the 70s and stuff like that, yes, we spent a little bit more, but it was different in terms of things. We had a had equipment there and we had a larger military force since then we subsequently have scaled it back over the years in terms of um, 
using more technology and just looking at different roles in terms of the capabilities of what the role of the military forces are. So yes, in, in general, Harper in terms of the head count has probably kept it pretty consistent, but he has been and made commitments on modernization, which I'll get into earlier and later on in the presentation. So this is what you're seeing here. Now the argument that you're going to hear from the opposition is Harper basically has cut spending. Well, when he first came into power, uh, 2006 to 2011, he was in the minority parliament. So he could only get through what these guys would agree to fund. When he got into power under a mandate, he was able to increase spending as part of GDP, which required it. We needed new money for equipment, uh, uniforms, uh, compensation, all that as part of the modernization. He has a military 2020 plan that you're more than welcome to go to the government website and do a review. But this kind of gives you an example. He basically, after a few years of sp increase in funding, he rolled it back and scaled it back more to make sure that it was more sustainable. Now, what basically the UN or NATO would like done is they would like Canada to put a certain percentage, whether it's 2% of G uh, GDP into military. Well, it shouldn't be any mandate how much the government money needs to go into military. What needs to be, it needs to be strategic investments to support both the issues that support the, the local government in Canada as well as any international requirements. And that's really what basically Harper's focused on. This kind of gives you the trend line to show you that we have spiked up spending since the 90s where it was cut under uh, the austerity measures of Paul Martin and John Critchin. Here's what I want to show you here. This is what you're seeing. Now, basically, you're looking at when we did the estimated plan at results for 2013-2014, we had spiked up a lot. Well, some of that was to do with different initiatives in terms of spending money. Maybe it was to do with ISIS or rolling back of any work we were doing internationally, whether it was with the piracy or other issues with Iraq or support around that in the Middle East. So we might have pulled back some of our operations and kind of realigned it in terms of the 2014-2015. But the government still has made a commitment to continually fund military. Head, for, head count, this kind of just shows you that we're pretty consistent in terms of the head count since Harper took office. Now let's talk about basically the military itself. And this is why I'm getting into the Canadian frigate replacement. Most of our ships now are 40, 30, 40 years old. They need to be replaced. Any time a ship goes on a mission, it has to go through a refurbishment, whether that's engines or the metal on the ship's exterior in terms of handling certain things, the equipment, the machinery, uh, the guns, the equipment, all that, have to be upgraded so that if NATO or UN or a country asks for support, we have to retrofit those ships. Well, those ships are coming to an end of life stage, so that, therefore they need to be replaced. Stephen Harper has worked with the... Um, has worked on modernization of the new frigate contract. Now, this is a good thing to pull out here. It's part of his whole modernization of the 2020 plan. It's not just with frigates, it's helicopters. It's looking at a replacement for the CF, the, the CF planes. He's looking at the whole ga gamut of what we need in terms of supporting both inter domestic operations for Canada as well as international protocols or focus. Now, Halifax is at a, a boom cycle now because over the next 20 years the frigates are being built in Halifax. Now that benefits a lot of different things. What you do not hear from Thomas Mulcair is his commitment on this. Now he has says he supports the aerospace industry and he's promising another 40 million a year to support uh, innovation in the aerospace industry. Well, that all leads into multiple aspects of aerospace. That gets into aircraft, that gets into ships, that gets into troop carriers, that gets in the whole gamut of aerospace, including space research and different aspects, right? Now, the frigate replacement benefits Halifax significantly. That means they're hiring more welders that would be right now be displaced technically from um, the oil sand, so it's going to pick up some of that slack. It also allows that money to stay within Halifax and Nova Scotia in terms of revenue that can help support their programs. This really impacts Megan Leslie's writing, which she says absolutely nothing about. The other writing that's going to be impacted too is North Vancouver, as well as the uh, Quebec City writing that's also be involved with shipbuilding, whether that's to do with the Coast Guard boats 
or conversion of basically um, ships to make sure that they're, they're support vessels. And North Vancouver is another area. These are areas typically, especially North Van and Van, uh, Halifax, they're held by the NDP. So the NDP riding is benefiting from the commitment of the government to spend on military. Yet you will never hear the NDP talk about that. Why? Because they're, they're anti-military. They're against it. They voted every law down or bill that supports supply bill that supports spending on the military because they don't believe in it. Now this just gives you an example that the frigate contract in Nova Scotia now is kicked off, which again benefits the local economy there. I wanted to highlight the new helicopters as this ties back to when John Cretchen was in power and shows you that Justin Trudeau is tied to the Cretchen re regime because he's actually brought Paul Martin into his his team if he gets elected on economic policies. Well, it's Paul Martin served under Cretchen when Cretchen cancelled the Sea King helicopters contract and we kept band-aiding those. Well Stephen Harper is finally delivering parts of the new Cyclone helicopters as part of the overall air sea rescue and support of military operations I said both within Canada and externally. This basically just gives you an example of the projected expenses so if you look at basically 2015 to 2016 we're spending close to 19 billion in basically spending. Planned spending is about 19.2. We're dropping it down 2017, 2018. And let's stop it there. What likely has happened, and I would go, encourage you to go out and look for the request for plans and priorities, there might be some changes that are happening in terms of the overall operations, in terms of what they feel in terms of the ISIS, so they might have be pulling that out of there. So I'd be very careful when you look at these numbers at a whole number. The NDP is good at looking at whole numbers, but they're not good at looking at details and to tell you what's driving those priority settings. Basically, this is just looking at the whole procurement process basically is kind of looking at this over the next year. They're trying to to improve it. Yes, there were some mistakes in the past, but they're, they're trying to strengthen the ability to make better cost controls on procurement. Now, let me tell you a couple things here. Uh, a few months ago, before the election started, I sent out an email to Jack Harris. Jack Harris is the military critic for the, the NDP government. Now, I never got a response from this email and there's good reason why because it would have to disclose their policy so I basically highlighted different things one of the things in there is a video done by the critic for OAS on um, old age security and her comment is out there on YouTube and I would encourage you to read it because it puts things in it and aligns what my statements are in terms of the NDP's philosophies and policies what that gal said is she would rather take money spent on military and put it back into old age security. Her idea is we can always depend on the US to bail us out. Well, that's the NTP's philosophy. Don't well, don't worry about anything, other people will bail us out. That's not what Canada's here for. That's not what the role of the military has been over the years. And unfortunately if you vote an NTP government, you'll get less and less of a military. Because I did a presentation again lines up to the presentation I did earlier about the uh, MTP platform like I said there's about 19 million billion dollars being spent on military you remember how I talked about in one of my other presentations and I'll just reiterate it the government spends about 18 billion in basically program direct program spending okay the military is 25 percent of that budget so there's gaps in basically the NDP's platform. What's the biggest budget cut that's going to actually be impacted? Doesn't it appear to be the military? And if we're cutting, say, $5 billion out of the military, what's that going to leave us in terms of a military force that's agile or the ability to support both internal initiatives or global operations based on NATO-driven directives? It's not going to provide things, right? And some of the other areas there I basically have talked about aerospace fund and I talked about basically well Kerr's brought it out recently about the aerospace fund he's never talked about the Pratt Whitney contract that was uh, rewarded he has never talked about the issues with exports because for example London's uh, General Dynamics plant exports truth carriers and it's world renowned for that and the 
Harper got a, a deal with Saudi Arabia. People are okay with us bringing in Saudi Arabia oil, but they're not okay if we start selling military equipment to these countries. So the NDP is great at playing this little game of being hypocrites in terms of policy. What they're not good at is saying how they'll do things properly in terms of the grand scheme of things and managing everything, all aspects of policy. All they're good at doing is pandering for votes. They're not good at providing details. This again highlights the issues around basically the, the aerospace industry in Canada. It also highlights basically the, the fact is, is if we have a strong aerospace industry which is supporting both the military contracts as well as exports, then guess what that does? That supports the wages, it supports the corporate profits, that supports the social programs. You cannot have social programs unless you have a pretty solid private sector. The NDP goes wishy-washy around that for a purpose is they don't really want to disclose their taxation policies. Okay, I got disaster relief there just recently the military were sent in at a request of the Saskatchewan and Alberta governments, more so Saskatchewan by Brad Wall, to help support force fire fighting efforts. So we need to have a, a military force that's capable and ready. I'm not sure you're going to get that with an NDP government because as I said they're going to look for cuts in that because he's committed on a balanced budget so I would be very careful of what you get with an NDP government. That wraps up my presentation so I wanted to kind of highlight the military. Now I'm coming from it as a perspective of a finance person. I'm not coming at it for directly on I'm involved with military operations but I will say this you can go out and get different questions or comments on the military and basically what you can get from that is even one of the guys that's running for the Liberal Party actually said point blank and he was a guy, a general or a, a person that was running the Afghanistan operations is he said the biggest threat is the refugees that are hung up at the border and that's what he said many 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 months ago okay and this is about a year ago realistically why are they at the border well, they're running from being beheaded because they don't agree with Sharia law. So, yes, we need to deal with the refugee, but if we don't stabilize their area or provide support, guess what? You're not going to have, uh, you're not going to solve that issue. The second thing you're going to hear Mulcair say is that we're in violation of UN laws in terms of going into Syria. Well, first of all, Syria is under a civil war. Okay, so right now. The land that's being claimed is no longer basically under control of Syria government. Okay, so if it's not Syrian government and the UN doesn't recognize that land, how are they going to really win a battle? It's, it's as if ISIS is going to take Canada to court over violations. Not going to happen. So this is kind of stuff you're seeing pandering because guess what? Mulcair likes to pander for things because he is what he is. He, he's all about power. He's not about facts. And the sooner you, some of you people ask questions to this guy, the sooner you realize that this guy's not suited, suitable to run anything, but a, even including a pretzel stand. I would encourage you as you go out to kind of look at this stuff to make sure you ask questions of these leaders to say where do they really stand on the details of their policy. Thank you.